Hello and welcome to another session of Pathology Scuba, where we dive into disease pathogenesis. I'm Dr. Pratima Singh, and for today's session, I'm going to do lung cancer histology. In this video, what I want to do is show you the histomorphology of the most common types of lung cancers so that you can recognize them more easily. And it's not just to teach you to diagnose things microscopically, but it's also to tie in how those particular cells look with pathophysiologic concepts that underlie the etiology of those particular neoplasias. Again, this session is Ideally for medical students, if you don't have some biomedical education coming into this session, it probably won't be an ideal experience. Conversely, I do not teach this material in enough detail to really supply the practicing physician with the information they would need either. So this is definitely an educational tool intended for medical students. The ideal demographic for today's session is a student who would look at an image like this and think, what am I even looking at? This just looks like abstract art. But what I want to do is really educate you on what you are looking at when you look at the microscopic appearance of the three most common lung cancers. And in order from most common, adenocarcinoma is top of the list, followed by squamous carcinoma, followed by small cell neuroendocrine carcinoma. These are the big three lung cancers. Previous iterations of classification of lung cancer had small cell carcinoma and non-small cell carcinomas. And this is not ideal because non-small cell carcinoma is left over from an era where we would lump all these tumors together because we had limited understanding of these tumors and limited treatment modalities. These days, we have more specific treatments available for adenocarcinoma and squamous carcinoma and small cell carcinoma, so we definitely need to categorize these appropriately. When we look at tissues underneath the microscope, we are looking at two major features to help us understand what we're looking at. We're looking at cytology and we're looking at architecture, and it's important to understand these concepts as we go into this material. So what is cytology? Cytology is the characteristics of the cells themselves. What shape are they? How big are they? What color are they? So what does it mean if our cells are green? Or what, what does it mean if they're triangular? And of course, these are just symbolic representations. But as we will learn, it is the quality of what the cells themselves look like that help us classify these tumors. The next question to ask ourselves is, how are these cells arranged? Perhaps they just sort of clump together formlessly. Maybe they make very distinct patterns, and it's the patterns that these cells make as they grow that define the architecture. So again, the concepts of cytology and architecture will be recurring themes throughout this presentation. So let's start off with the most common lung cancer, adenocarcinoma. And if we do nothing more than just define it, we'll find a wealth of information just in the name. Carcinoma means a malignant neoplasm of epithelial cells. If we put the prefix adeno in front of it, we are specifically talking about glandular cells or secretory cells. Putting them together, it is a malignant neoplasm derived from glandular epithelium. What glandular cells are we talking about within the respiratory system? Well, lining the airways is, of course, our respiratory epithelium, these pseudostratified columnar cells with cilia on the top. We also have these goblet cells that contain mucin, and here you can see the illustration of those. So those are glandular cells that line our airways. Further out in the lung parenchyma, you have type 2 pneumocytes. And we don't have enough time to go into all of the histology, but glandular epithelium and specialized glandular epithelium is present pretty much throughout the lung. So adenocarcinomas can occur pretty much anywhere. The most helpful feature of adenocarcinoma is the architecture of a gland itself. So once you see an architectural pattern showing you gland formation, you can be more assured that you are likely dealing with an adenocarcinoma. And on the left-hand side, you can see sort of a range of what a glandular profile would look like microscopically. Sometimes they're round, sometimes they're oval, sometimes they're tortuous, but they all have in common that the malignant cells are growing around a central lumen, a central space. And this is 
very, very relatable to the concept of these being malignant glandular cells because what do glandular cells want to do? They want to secrete material and that lumen is the area in which these cells would ideally be secreting whatever material that they are producing. So this recapitulates their glandular origin. Glandular architecture is the key to figuring out that a tumor is adenocarcinoma. What if you don't have it? Maybe you have a very, quote, poorly differentiated tumor that doesn't show gland architecture at all. Well, without architecture, you are reliant on cytology. So let's break down a cytologic feature that might help us in this case. There are some clear areas in these cytoplasm. You can see a white space. Now, an experienced pathologist might start to be concerned that that is actually a mucin droplet in poorly differentiated glandular cells. And even though it's very hard to tell from just that H and E image, if you put a special mucin stain on it, like this mucicarmin stain, you'll highlight that there is cytoplasmic mucin. So finding mucin within cells is another defining feature of adenocarcinoma. So if the glandular features don't help you, the cytologic features can help you. And if you ever see an image like this on a test, you would be very hard pressed to identify this as mucin. But if you see a special stain like mucicarmin or a PAS stain, demonstrating the presence of intracellular mucin. Think about adenocarcinoma. Moving along to squamous carcinoma, let's talk about squamous epithelium itself. Stratified squamous epithelium starts with that basal layer that as it matures and terminally differentiates, flattens out. And this provides us a very nice protective layer of squamous mucosa. On the skin surface, we have an additional layer of this keratin. And this keratin helps our skin provide extra protection and provides a waterproof barrier, both to keep our internal water inside our body and to keep external water from inappropriately entering our body. So this keratin layer is a defining feature of the squamous epithelium that lines our skin. And that's going to come in very important when we talk about squamous tumors. The big question that we have to start off with is how do we get squamous epithelium in our lungs to begin with? For squamous carcinoma to grow, there has to be squamous epithelium somewhere. Take a look at this diagram of the trachea and the lungs. Where in this would you expect squamous epithelium to occur normally? Nowhere. There should be no squamous epithelium in this area, but there is a process, an adaptive process, where one epithelium can change into another epithelium, and you probably already know the name of it. It's metaplasia. So metaplasia has to occur for us to get squamous epithelium in our respiratory system. This image shows us the concept of squamous metaplasia occurring in the respiratory airway. You can see a depiction of the normal respiratory epithelium, and here's its histologic counterpart. And as it moves over to the right-hand side, it is now replaced by squamous epithelium. So what has to happen to take our nice, healthy, columnar, um, mucinous epithelium and change it into this squamous epithelium in the lung? Well, we have to irritate it. And you've probably already guessed that the most common form of irritating our epithelium so that it has to adapt and become squamous epithelium is, of course, smoking. So squamous carcinoma tends to evolve in patients who are heavy smokers or who have had a history of significant smoking. This is a full timeline of what occurs in the genesis of squamous carcinoma from our normal bronchial epithelium after repeat injury and insult, squamous metaplasia sets in. This predisposes to dysplastic conditions, which then evolve into full-on squamous carcinoma in situ. And then once that particular neoplasm becomes invasive, it becomes our invasive squamous carcinoma. So the features of a malignant squamous neoplasm in the lung will again recapitulate some of the features that you see 
in normal squamous histology. So one of the things that gets talked about a lot are intercellular bridges. And you might be able to pick out that there is sort of a um, prickly appearance between some of these cells. And these are the intercellular bridges representing those desmosomes that hold those squamous cells so adherently. One of the reasons why squamous epithelium is such a good protective barrier is because of the tight junctions between these cells. And you can see that feature, again, captured in the malignant counterpart of the squamous carcinoma. My personal belief is that this feature can be helpful, but first of all, you don't always see it. And second of all, you can imagine that you see it sometimes when it's not actually there. There's a more reliable feature, which is the presence of keratin. Little um, disclaimer, not all squamous carcinomas will keratinize, but when they do, it's an extremely helpful histologic tool. You can see it cytologically within the cells themselves, and you can see it architecturally in the formation of keratin pearls. Let's take a little better look at the keratin. Again, the keratinized cells are standing out because they're so much darker red than the paler pink cells of that invasive squamous carcinoma. And as this keratinization grows, it gets secreted and forms an extracellular ball of keratin. Think about how keratin on the skin surface is on top because there's a place for that keratin to be excreted. Here, you have no place for the keratin to go as this tumor invades down into the tissue. So it involutes upon itself and forms those keratin pearls. Based on what you know about the evolution of squamous carcinoma, it's intuitive to understand the distribution of squamous carcinomas in the lungs. In patients, particularly who are heavy smokers, the damage to the airways tends to be proximal. As these airways become more damaged, this is where squamous carcinomas will arise. So squamous carcinomas have a propensity to occur within the central zones of the lungs in the hilar region. This gross image shows you something that would be very typical of a squamous carcinoma. You see a cross section of a bronchus with the cartilaginous ring of that bronchus visible here in the periphery. And of course you see this bulky tumor. Well, this is a squamous carcinoma and it has arisen from the surface of this airway. And it has not only invaded the adjacent lung parenchyma, it's also grown into the bronchial lumen nearly occluding it. And this is very classic of what squamous carcinomas can do. This is the converse situation. What you're looking at in this image is the shiny purple tan surface of the pleura. So we're looking externally, but we notice that the pleura has this abnormal appearance here, this sunken appearance. What's occurring here is there's something underneath the pleura pulling it down. And think about a process that would involve the pleura. You'd expect it to be pretty peripheral in nature. So let's cut across this we see a lung tumor. And this lung tumor has arisen peripherally near the pleura. And then it has invaded the pleura and sucked the pleura down into its malignant growth. And when you see a peripheral tumor involving the pleura like this, it's much more likely to be an adenocarcinoma. You wouldn't expect a squamous carcinoma to necessarily arise out here in the periphery because it wouldn't have an airway to be associated with. Finally, we come to small cell neuroendocrine carcinoma. This is also called small cell carcinoma, but neuroendocrine is an important uh, nomenclature to add to this term because it does impart the notion that these cells come from neural crest origin. The term small cell carcinoma can also be misleading because first of all, these cells aren't always that small. Second of all, when you're looking at a field of tumor cells, can you always tell that they're small? I mean, in this image, do these cells look particularly small? Can you tell? If I did this, would it help? What other features of these cells might help us make a diagnosis of small cell neuroendocrine carcinoma? When you look at this image, what you'll notice is that these cells are comprised of pretty much nuclei. Where's the cytoplasm? It's pretty inconspicuous, you don't see it. And that's characteristic of small cell neuroendocrine carcinoma. These cells are nuclei, and not just nuclei, crowded, molded nuclei. So that nuclear molding is a feature. Again, these tumors grow at a very fast rate, and the 
rapid growth and the very cellular nature of these tumors go together. So these nuclei are literally squashed up against each other, forming that molding pattern. The second thing that people talk about is, quote, salt and pepper chromatin. And I'll be honest, I've always disliked that term. When I put salt and pepper on my food, I don't see the salt. That's how I wind up putting too much salt on my food. But what they're trying to talk about is the finely dispersed nature of the chromatin in these cells. So it's kind of just uh, sort of scattered, giving that sort of speckled, that finely speckled appearance. So that is salt and pepper chromatin. But nuclear molding is a little bit easier to identify. There's other things you can also look at. First of all, because of the very uh, rapid growth, a lot of these tumors will show areas of necrosis in there. And as they necrose and their chromatin clumps, it can actually coalesce around these vessels. And this DNA that's basically deposited itself around the vessel shows this blurred blue-purple haze, and that's called the azoparty effect. So if you're looking at a tumor that shows this, again, this kind of blur of blue around these vessels, think about small cell neuroendocrine carcinoma. As with the other tumors, small cell carcinoma has a tendency to occur in a particular location. Like squamous carcinomas, small cell carcinomas like to occur centrally. In fact, they like to occur so centrally that sometimes they don't even have an obvious lung mass. They can occur as a mediastinal mass primarily. So that's classic for small cell carcinoma. Interestingly enough, along with the other central tumor, the squamous carcinoma, there's a high linkage of smoking and small cell carcinoma development. So in smokers, you would expect to see squamous carcinoma and small cell carcinomas. Some adenocarcinomas will arise in smokers as well, but non-smokers are more likely to get adenocarcinoma than either small cell or squamous carcinoma. So hopefully, after going through this, you can take something that looks like this, and instead of saying, what am I even looking at? You'll notice the nuclear mold, and you'll notice the small cells, and you'll think, that's probably small cell carcinoma. You might look at something like this and say, okay, I see that keratin pearl. I think I might even see some intercellular bridges. I think this is squamous cell carcinoma. And finally, you'll say, oh, this is easy. This has glandular profiles in this neoplasm. This is an adenocarcinoma. Thank you for watching. Subscribe if you want to see more pathology randomness. Please feel free to share it around. And if you have any comments or ideas for future sessions, you can always reach out to me. And again, my ideal goal is to get everyone to love pathology like I do. I've been Pratima Singh. Thank you so much.